Continuing down through our cloud code section here, we can now come to triggers. Now triggers are pieces of code that are run on our server every time a condition is met in the database. More often than not, triggers will have to be run in cloud code, otherwise they won't work. They will run whenever something happens in our data. Now there's some examples here that make reference to the standard tables that we get in our database. The examples that I'm going to use will actually be using the data that we've already got. A trigger can generally be identified with a before or an after. So it'll be before something happens or after something happens. Down the right hand side, you can see some examples. We have save triggers, delete triggers, file triggers, find triggers, session triggers and live query triggers. And the majority of them, if not all of them, have before and after variations of that. Some of the examples in this documentation will be relevant to your database and some of them won't. But we'll work through these and I'll show you some resources for where you can get additional information if you want to use them in your application. Before we get started with triggers, the one thing that you just need to be aware of once you've understood a bit more about how they work is that there are potentially some consequences for using them. For example, whenever you are editing the database or whenever you are adding a record to the database, sometimes it may go into a pending class first and then change to the master class afterwards. So there could potentially be two events there that would fire your trigger. And this is explained a bit more under the consequences for triggers down here. Have a look through that. Another common question I had at the beginning was to understand, well, what's included inside of the request object and what data can we get out of this whenever we're passing through a, a trigger? Because here's an example of an aftersave trigger, which is morales.cloud.aftersave. You name the class that you want to be looking at, and then you're going to run a function, which will take a parameter here, which is going to be the request. So what data is included in that request and what can we use? That might be a question. We'll cover that as well. Another question that I find is, well, if the trigger fails, does it actually stop any data from being saved in the database? So these are the kinds of questions that I want to cover in this particular video. And I'll start with the easy one. Does it prevent the items from being saved or does it prevent the operation that you're trying to do before the trigger? Typically, as a rule of thumb, the before triggers would prevent the operation from running, but the after triggers would not. I'm remembering that the Morales server is a fork of the PARS server. You could also find more information on the parsplatform.org website. There's a note here about local dev chains. If you are using Ganache or Hardhat for your application at this stage, then just remember that the way that the blocks are mined might affect your transaction. So your trigger behavior might not work exactly how you intended on a local dev chain. There is a tutorial video here for some basic triggers from Nicholas. It doesn't cover everything down the right hand side, but it will give you an introduction if you are completely new. And then we can start looking at the triggers. So we'll begin with save triggers first. We have two that we're going to look at. The first one is before save. The second one is after save, and then we'll briefly touch on context dictionaries, which you can pass in It's a more advanced technique, to add additional functionality to your triggers. So what is a before save trigger? Well, it will allow you to run a function on data that's in your database, perhaps before the intended save happens. Now, a save might be when you're adding an item to the database or just when you're trying to edit the data inside of your database. So as the name implies, before saves are calls that run before saving a new object to the database. So this example here, we've already seen something similar to before because this is to do with implementing data validation, which we've done in a previous section in cloud functions. And specifically, there is a before save trigger. There's nothing in the first function body, but they have passed across a validation object and that validation object is checking the fields that are being passed through to make sure that stars is included because it's required and that the stars are somewhere between one and five and if they're not then they would throw an error that would simply say that that's required so this isn't new we've seen something like this before 
And like it says here, the reason for having the validation is because you don't want the user to have the ability to give minus six stars or you know, a thousand stars in a review. So you want to reject and throw that out before it's saved into the database. There's another example here, which is a comment example. And so it's checking the length of the comment. And if the comment is too long, then they're effectively truncating it and uh, modifying the information once it's being saved. So you'll notice again, save, And the first argument here is either going to be a string, which would be the name of the class that you want to hook into, or it can be a predefined class such as moralis.user, like this one here. And the function itself that you pass through takes just one parameter, which is the trigger request. And inside of that trigger request, you could have various properties that you could hook into. Now, in previous videos, we've looked at the request.user, we've looked at potentially the request.master and some other things. But in this example, you could also hook into these request.installation ID, type string, and that would be the installation ID if set triggering the request. The master is just to see whether or not the master key was used. The request.user would be the Morales user that made the request. Request.user is a pointer to the Morales user, and that is the user that made the request. Request object would be the object that triggered the hook. Request IP is the IP address of the client making the request. And you could also get access to the request headers, the request trigger name. And that might be useful if you want to keep a log of the different triggers that were used. And you've also got request.log and request.original. So let's take a look at a before save trigger in action. Over in my Visual Studio code, I copied the previous example from the documentation and made some edits because what I want to do is I want to use my database to weed out any creation of a unit where the upkeep would be more than two. And this is a, a really basic example, but it's just to show you the kind of output you'll get. So in the code, I've just hooked into my unit table. I'm looking in fields. I've got this validation object that I'm using. I'm looking at the upkeep field. It has to be required. So now the option will return whether it's true that the upkeep is less than two. If it is, everything's fine. If it's not, because the object wants to save something at either two or three, then I'll return a message. I'll just edit this to, you must set upkeep under two. So we'll save that. We'll go back to the front end. We'll try and create a new unit and see what happens. And I'll press it a couple of times until I get an error. So that's the, oh, I got an error straight away. Okay, I'll press it another couple of times. There you go, got another error, another error. So I pressed it a few times that didn't get an error, but there were four times where I did. So now we've got a number of new units. Upkeep is all below two because the before save trigger is throwing out anything that would be over that. Okay, so that's before save. We come down now, we also have after save. Now the after save trigger will not stop data from being saved into your database as it explains here under the async behavior section. And one example that you could use after save for would be adding information maybe to another class in your database somewhere. So in our example, if we've created this unit class, perhaps we want to log some additional information somewhere else. So I showed you just a moment ago this here where we've got all the different properties from the request object. So let's just say, for example, and again, this is another very basic example, but we want to create a request log like actually this I've pre done hooked onto the after save trigger. And I'm just going to be adding information into the database, which logs some of that information that's available to us. Now you might have a class here that maybe has like an address of the unit, maybe your address details for this particular unit. Maybe you want to find out where they live. Maybe you're going to add some information to a meta class, yeah, a class that stores things like the weapon that this unit has or the color of their outfit or some of the information that makes that particular unit unique. And you don't want that information to be available. And so you have it in a separate class. Maybe you'll do that, whatever it might be. Once you've created a unit, it's then going to be saving additional information somewhere else. So let's see how we would do that. So this request log class can be written just like this. The morales.cloud.aftersave will hook into the unit. The aftersave works much the same way. In terms of the parameters for this, you would either pass through a string for the class that you want to hook into, whatever class you want to use. And then the second parameter would be a function. That'd be the function that you want to run after a save. 
and the function should just take one parameter, which would be the morales.cloud.trigger request. And again, this is only available in cloud code. So what is this doing? Well, the first thing it's doing is it is creating a morales.object.extend for request log. That's the name of the class that we're going to be creating or adding to in our database. And then we're going to do a new request log. And we're going to set some properties to that request log. We're going to set user object, IP, headers, trigger name, original master, and installation ID. And all of those will come from the request object. And then at the end of that, we'll just return request log dot save. And then that will save all of these properties after we've saved our initial unit. But that's how that was written. Now this one, I'm just going to set to less than or equal to three. It will never fail because we've also got other validation somewhere else. So I'll just leave that there and I'll just go and create a few new items just to demonstrate this after save trigger. So we had 11 requests in the database. Let's go to the front end. We'll just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Refresh the database. And now we've got all of these extra ones here. Now you'll notice here that in the database, I've got an original field that says undefined for the majority, but it says, or well, there is a pointer for the other ones. And the reason that that has happened is because we created a new item. It didn't have anything originally. But if I went into a unit, for example, and just change, let's say this upkeep from three to two and go into the request log. Now we've got a brand new object here and it does have this original pointer because there was data there before. The pointer doesn't show you what the data was. It just shows you which particular unit was edited. So inside here, you've got the headers if you need them. You'd have the IP address of the user, which is me. You've got here, it shows you whether a master key was used. And as you can see, false for the majority of them because they were created from the front end where we didn't need a master key, but we actually edited them just a second ago using this dashboard browser. And that did use the master key. So that's how it will show you there. It shows the installation ID. And then we've got the object for the actual unit that was edited here. And we've got the user that created the request from the front end. It says undefined on these because these were produced in the back end in this browser. Okay, now your table that you will create here would probably look very different to that. I just wanted to demonstrate the data that appears inside of that request object when you're using your triggers. So let's take a look at how to use the before delete trigger. I'm gonna copy this code into my Visual Studio code. I'll put it down the bottom here. So let's just analyze this function very quickly. So this is going to register a before delete function. And like before, the first argument could either be a string or it could be a Morales object. In our case, we want to hook into the class in a database called unit because that's where I'm going to be trying to delete some objects. The first part would be defining a query. So it wants to run a new Morales query into a class called photo. We don't have that in our database. And then it wants to find where the album equals to the request object. Then it's going to provide a count. It passes the master key. And then if the count is greater than zero, which means that there are some photos in this album, then it will throw an error. And this before delete function will stop the delete from happening in the database. Okay, so that we want this to be used in our function, but this doesn't really make any sense. I'm just going to put some simple logic in here and say, if two is greater than three, which it isn't, then throw this out, which means that this expression will resolve to false. And therefore this throw command will not run, which means I can delete as many things as I like. So let's just test that. It should allow me to delete however I want to delete. So I'll go to the dashboard, go into the browser, go to the unit table, and I'll select a unit here. It doesn't matter which one it is. Delete the row, click yes, and it's refreshed. I had 72, now I have 71. I can go to the front end of the application and I've got a command here called destroy object. Just go and get all of my units, copy the object ID, paste that in there, run that. And again, it deletes the object from the front end as well. But if we just swap this through, so now let's say our logic, which would be in here, could be a query in our database table. Eventually we will have some logic that will resolve to either true or false. Now, if the logic is true, then we're going to throw, we can't delete. And then you put whatever the reason is. Okay. Let's go to the front end, try and delete something. And we'll go and get the units and let's select this one here, run the old function. 
paste in the object ID and now we get an error. Can't delete this unit because, which was the error that we had before. So we'll check it from the back end as well. Let's just select this one here, edit, delete this row and down the right hand side error deleting the unit. If we go to the logs, then we will see the same thing. Before delete failed and the reason was down here. Excellent. So I've just given you an example with logic that's just a true or false using a mathematical expression, but you would be using your own query logic using a Morales query or perhaps something else as part of your database that we've covered already. So that's before delete. Let's take a look at after delete. Similar to we've mentioned before, before delete will restrict the deleting of an object from your database, but the after delete function will not. This will happen after that object has deleted. So let's have a look at an example of the after delete trigger I'll copy this code and paste it into Visual Studio code and just tidy things up so this is running a query then it's finding all of the items that were in that query it returns a promise and then morales.object.destroy all it will delete everything that comes back from this query we're going to ignore that and we're going to run something else so we're going to have some sort of logic and then we're going to handle and what are we going to do? We're going to be looking at the after delete in the ah, the unit table, not the post table. And so first of all, we should check whether our before delete is going to block anything. So if three is greater than two, which means that's true, which means this runs. So it's going to block everything. So we need to do the inverse of that. So let's just turn that off. Uh, we'll also go back to our previous after and we'll just copy this because we want to do the same thing in here. So this is what we'll do if we get something that's true. So let's write some logic and a normal logic would involve some kind of query or something inside of your database. But for me, I'm just gonna do something really super simple. Just define a couple of variables, then define a logic expression. That will evaluate to true. So if it's true, then we can run this code put that inside the curly braces. We'll save that, go back to the front end. So if I just go and get the units, copy this one, for example, run the destroy object, paste that in, see what we get back. Well, it looks like it deleted it. So now if we go back to the database, if we go to our request log, and there we go. So now we have a new after delete trigger in here. So let's see what happens if we try and delete a couple of units from the back end. Let's delete these first two. It deletes both of those and we go into our request log and you'll see that they both appear here. So this is just an example where I've taken information from our request object. But of course, you might want to do something else with your data and save a different type of data in a different class somewhere else. But I've just shown you the process of how you might go about doing that. Great. So that's the delete triggers. Super simple so far. File triggers. Well, throughout this tutorial course, I haven't actually updated or uploaded any files, but there are tutorials for how to do that in our Morales YouTube channel. I recommend checking that out to supplement this documentation as well. But the first one here, this registers a before save file function. So in this example, there are well, actually there are three examples here. The first one is how to change a file name. The second one is returning an already saved file. And the third one is saving a different file from the URI. And you'll notice that in each of these examples, they have registered a before save file function. The function takes two parameters. The first one is normally going to be a subclass within the database that you will want to hook into, although neither of these examples seem to have done that. And the second argument would be a function, which is what both of them have used. Now, the function itself passes a request as a parameter. And the request is actually destructured a couple of times in here. For example, here, they've destructured this request object to get the file properties. And in this example, they've destructured it to get the user properties. So this would actually be the morales.file object. And this would be the morales.user object from this request. And I'll show you some of the other properties that would be available using the file trigger here. Installation ID, master, user and file were the two that we were looking at. And that's the type that we were just discussing there. So if the user is set, it's the user that made the request. And if the file is set, it's the file that was triggering the hook. And you've got access to the IP, the headers, the trigger name and the log as well. And so in this example with the destructured file property here, they're saving the data from the file.getData method. 
and then they're creating a new Morales file with a different file name and returning that new file before the file is saved in the database. So the user uploads a file, it's going to run through this function and rename it. Uh, this particular example, returning an already saved file. So in this particular example, perhaps the user has uploaded a file and the application is just going to respond by saving the original one because it already exists. So there's some examples of the before save file. You can add metadata or tags to your files as well using this particular trigger. There's an example of how to do that here. And in this example, they have destructured both the file and the user properties of the request. They've used file.addMetadata, which hooks into the user ID now, the new destructured user ID, and file.addTag. So two methods used there. And again, using the before save trigger. Okay, after save file, there's an example here of registering an after save file function. It's available only in cloud code as the same with all of the other ones that we've done so far. And if we break down the example in here, the after save is just passing through a function. It's got the typical request object. And this time the file, file size and user properties have been destructured from the request object. They've run a new Morales object called file object. That's basically equivalent to extending a new class name called file object and then creating a new instance. With this new instance, this new instantiated object, they're setting some attributes. They're setting the file, the file size, and they're created by using the properties that were destructured from the request object, adding a session token, and then saving the file object. So after saving a file, it then creates its own custom object and saves that into a database under the file object table. So whenever a file is uploaded, it's basically adding data somewhere else as well. And you can do that in your application using something similar to this. This before delete file function could prevent a file from being saved into your database. However, the after save file would not prevent it. We looked at save file just a second ago. Now we can look at delete file. It's the same idea as some of the previous ones we've already looked at. So in these examples here, uh, the first one actually is an after save file trigger, which is similar to the previous one that we had here. Maybe with just less properties that were set. The after save file has a function and the request object has been destructured. We've got the file and the user properties in here. The example has created a new Morales object called file object and it's set a couple of properties and then saved it. The before delete file, it destructures the request object. We have the file and the user properties or the Morales file and the Morales user object. Uh, this time it does a query into the file object table that was created. It looks for where the file name is equal to the file name. So the file name in the database is equal to the file that's been uploaded or trying to be deleted, should I say. It returns the very first one from that list. There's some conditional logic to see whether the ID on the file matches the ID trying to destroy it. And if that fails, then the delete will, will also fail and there'll be an error that says you do not have permission to delete this file. Okay, so that gives you an example of how you would use before delete file. After delete file, let's take a look at this one. Morales.cloud after delete file. Again, it runs a function, takes a request parameter. It's been destructured. So we now have a Morales.file object here. There's a query inside the file object class, and it wants to find where the file name in the database equals the file's name that's being deleted or that was deleted. It returns the first result and then destroys it. So in this example here, this is assuming that you have additional file objects that you created when you saved a, a new file. So when a file was saved, they created extra data that was added to the database. Morales server won't realize that that extra data exists. So you would have to go in and do that using this process. So in this example, once a file is deleted, it just cleans up the extra file objects. Okay. The triggers are not too difficult to get your head around once you've used a few before. They all follow the same principle as each other. Depending on the operation that you're looking to complete, it will then hook into that and do something either before or after it happens. Now, find triggers. Again, we don't need to really go into much detail on demonstrating this because I think it will make sense. I've covered already about the properties before. Well, this example actually displays them all for you. So if you hook into the morales.cloud.before find, 
you can pass through as argument one either a string for the class that you want to search in or you can pass in the predefined classes such as the moralist user the second argument will be a function you can pass through the request parameter and this example here we've just created variables for all of the different properties that you can hook into if you want to and there's quite a few examples that you can run through here you might want to also make reference to the parse documentation so you can find out some extra functions that might complement this but you can select keys as an example there's asynchronous support so if you get some kind of uh, promise for example maybe you're using like the each method in the parse documentation or some other function that returns a promise then this example could be useful you could return a different query this utilizes the or method returns either this query or that query depending on if whatever comes back you can reject queries by throwing a new moralis error or rejecting a promise and there's also some read preferences that you could set here as well so that would be for before find and after find and after find would be in case you want to change somehow the results of the query before they're sent back to the client we've got a couple of useful session triggers that you can use as well you've got before login and after logout so maybe in your code or maybe in your tables once you've added information to a particular user maybe that you've got an is banned flagged and so you just want to make sure before they're logged in, you're checking to see whether the user is banned. And if so, you throw an error denying them access and reminding them that they have been banned. That's just one example. You might have various other fields in your tables for which you could check before the user logs in. Just be aware of a couple of things. First of all, the before login trigger waits for any promises to resolve. And until the before login trigger completes, the user is not available on the request object. The trigger will run on username and password logins and also any MetaMask or Wallet Connect logins, but it does not run on a sign up or if the login credentials are wrong. After logout is typically a cleanup operation. You get access to the session object that was deleted on logout. And if you need to, you can then use that to perform some user tasks. And in this example, we pass a request object into our function and the session object is destructured here. The example gets the user and sets their is online to false and then saves it with a master key. So that's as an example of user status. There's lots of other ways you might want to incorporate that. So whilst you get access to the session object, it has already been deleted. You can just use the information to find something else if needed. If there is no session object for whatever reason, then the trigger will not run. OK, and we'll finish up with the live query triggers. So we've looked through live queries already. We did that in the database section. We've got a number of different live query triggers that we can use before connect, before subscribe, after live query event. Uh, you've also got on live query events. So the before connect trigger, maybe you just want to restrict access to only users that are logged in. So you could use the request object, look for a request user. And if you don't have one, then you could throw that connection out. So that's the actual connection to the live query server before any live queries are even subscribed to, which would be the next one. That's the before subscribing to a live query. And in this example of this before subscribe trigger, there are two things that it's doing. First of all, it's checking whether the user is admin or not. And if not, then it throws them an error saying that they're not authorized. And then the next thing it's doing is restricting the results to a subset of just two keys, name and year from the query because in this case they wanted to transform the subscription query you may not need to do that you may not want to do that with after live query event we saw something similar to this with the after find trigger and that's that in some cases you might want to actually change the results of a live query before they're sent to the client there are two examples here so in this example when it creates the after live query event it's doing two things it is getting access to the request.object and also the request.original. You'll notice before when I sent you this, when I showed you this, you had the request object and the request original. So this is essentially then forking off. So you're having the request object showing this is the name and you're having the request original showing this is the name. And I'll leave you to take a look through the other examples for the last parts of these triggers here, as I believe we've covered the most common ones already. That brings us to the end of the trigger section. So now we'll jump over onto jobs.